Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? I've previously fixed up a few Sony cassette Walkmans, and there's one portable player in my queue I have left to repair. But this one's a bit different. Instead of another Sony model, I picked up a Panasonic RQ SX20. It was released in 1997 as a mid-range model in its lineup. It has many similarities to its Sony counterparts, both in appearance and in features. Its enclosure is made out of metal, and it features auto-reverse, Dolby B noise reduction, bass boost, and can also support an inline remote control. Competition was fierce in this segment of the market, so these were all considered core competencies of any player at its price point. I couldn't find much information confirming how much it sold for, but my best guess is that it cost about $100 US when new. Normally the SX20 is powered by a rechargeable gumstick battery, but mine also included the optional external battery holder, which attaches to the bottom. It accepts a standard AA battery, which I find a bit more convenient. This particular unit has some scratches and wear, which I'm not surprised to see. I also wasn't surprised to find that it had functional problems too. I dropped in a test tape and pressed play to find that it only made a faint whirring sound and the tape didn't move. So of course the next step was to take the player apart. The cover containing the buttons is held on with screws on all sides. Then I could lift it away to expose the main circuit board. And as is typically the case with these, the belt that drives the reels has gone bad with age. But unlike other players I've fixed, on this one the pulleys are covered by the PCB, so I removed the screws holding it down. I tried lifting it up so I could flip it over, but the entire assembly came with it. Panasonic did something a bit annoying here, and soldered the PCB to a few parts that stay with the mechanism. There are solder joints by the battery compartment, and a few more over by the headphone jack. So I carefully desoldered them. These seven pads seem to connect to the motor, and there are three more that go to the tape sensor. The final three are part of the auto-reverse mechanism. And that was enough to get me access. There are actually two belts in here. One goes from the motor to a pulley with a gear, and the next gear has a belt that drives another pulley. Both belts, of course, had turned to sticky goo. This is a function of age and not just use, and with this player pushing 25 years old, this problem is to be expected. I bought a set of new aftermarket replacement belts as the original parts have long since gone out of production. These were fairly inexpensive, about $10 US, including shipping. I got what was left of the original belts removed, then cleaned inside the pulleys with some isopropyl alcohol. I got the new belts installed and made sure everything was turning smoothly. Time to put this thing back together. I flipped the PCB into place, then reinstalled the screws that hold it down. I applied some flux to the joints I had desoldered earlier, then got them all reconnected. I got the cover put back on, making sure that the switch sliders on the outside match the positions of the actual switches on the PCB. If they don't line up, there's a risk you could break them. After that, it just came down to reinstalling the screws. I was feeling pretty confident about this repair, but when I loaded a tape and tried it out, it still didn't work. The tape would move slightly, but that was it. Thankfully, I found the problem pretty quickly. There's a switch on the PCB that tells the player which side of the tape is playing. It's moved by an arm connected to the tape mechanism, but the two weren't lined up. Basically, the player thought it was on side B when the mechanism was on side A. I was able to reach in with a spudger and gently slide the switch so it matched up with the arm. I also seem to have dodged a common problem with this model. There's a clutch assembly connected to the main gear, and often its retaining clip gets cracked with age, which prevents the tape transport from working. 
Mine happened to be fine, but if it wasn't, there are replacements available that are made from brass, so the issue won't happen again. Just for good measure, I cleaned the tape head and cap stands with a swab and some alcohol. They weren't overly dirty, but like the exterior of this SX-20, they'd definitely seen some use. I put the player back together and was relieved to find that it was playing tapes now as it should. But listening to the playback, there was some obvious flutter. Sometimes this works itself out over time, but I had a feeling that in this case, it wouldn't. I took the player apart again and inspected the new belts. It didn't take long to find the culprit. I noticed that as the belt went around the motor, it wobbled. This would be enough to cause the speed of the gears to vary and generate the flutter. And the wobble was likely due to some residue left on the motor pulley from the old belt. I must have missed some when cleaning it. So I took the new belt off and tried to clean it again. I stuffed an alcohol wipe in the gap and pressed it against the spindle with a screwdriver while spinning the motor. And indeed, I was still pulling belt residue from inside it. After the wipe started coming out of the pulley clean, I put the belt back on and found it was running smoothly. I reassembled and tested the player again, but now it was worse than before. Playback was much slower than it should have been, and turning the motor adjustment trimmer didn't get it back to the speed it should be. I needed to inspect the motor itself. I'd been avoiding removing it as all the information I'd found about this player said that doing so was either unnecessary or very difficult. Turns out neither of those are true. It's held in with just a pair of screws from the inside of the cassette compartment. And taking out the three screws securing the stator board made it significantly easier to remove the belt. I found that the stator board was the cause of the problem. It consists of six electromagnetic coils that energize in sequence to spin the motor pulley. Closer inspection revealed that one of the coils was damaged. I must have accidentally stabbed it with the screwdriver while trying to clean the remains of the old belt. With this one out of commission, the motor likely couldn't maintain the correct speed. I looked online for a replacement motor and came across a listing on AliExpress. But none of the part numbers were exact matches for what I had, and the reference they included for what motor goes to which player model didn't include the SX-20. I could have rolled the dice and bought a couple of different models to see if one would work, but I took a more surefire approach and just bought another SX-20. I had found it on Yahoo Auctions Japan listed as a parts unit, but cosmetically it was in excellent shape. In fact, it looked even better than the original player I'd bought, with far fewer scratches and wear, so I decided to simply swap the new belts over to it. As expected, the belts on this one were in rough shape too. Thankfully, they came off in larger pieces and didn't seem to stick to the pulleys as much. To keep from repeating my prior mistake, I took the motor out of the player, then disassembled it. This made cleaning the spindle far easier, and this is the method I'd recommend to anyone restoring a player like this one. I got the belt looped through, the stator board dropped back in, and the motor assembly screwed together and reinstalled in the player. I wasn't quite so lucky with the clutch assembly on this one though. The clip that holds the spring was missing. Thankfully, I was able to carefully remove the clip from the first SX-20 and snap it into place on the new one. After resoldering the connections on the PCB, I tested the player, but nothing. The motor would sometimes turn a tiny bit, but that was it. What was wrong this time? I suspected the problem might be electrical, and when I desoldered the PCB again, I noticed something. Some of the pins from the motor weren't sticking out as much as others. And here's why. It looks like they got desoldered from the stator board. 
I'm not sure if this player came to me like that, or if I accidentally heated these pins too much when desoldering the PCB the first time. But I got them sorted out with the soldering iron, and took the opportunity to carefully touch up the joints on the other pins while I was at it. And with the player back together once more, I got a welcome sight as soon as I dropped in a battery. Oh, no way! Looks like I was in much better shape now. That was it? So with the player working, how does it sound? Overall, pretty good, though there's still a little flutter to the playback. In this case, though, I think that will work itself out as I use the player. It already got a bit better after playing through just one tape. And I'm pretty impressed with the SX20 otherwise. The sound quality is decent and it's satisfyingly solid to hold, just like the Sony Walkmans I've worked on previously. It is a bit annoying to have to desolder the PCB just to access the belts, but the solder joints themselves are pretty easy to work on, as is the rest of this model. There's one feature that caught my attention that I'd never seen on other players. The base boost switch has a second position curiously labeled Train. According to the owner's manual, this lessens the leaking, noisy, high sound disturbing people around you. In other words, it rolls off the treble a bit to reduce headphone bleed in case you're on public transport, like the train or subway. In most other ways, the SX20 is a pretty ordinary portable cassette player. That's not a bad thing, though, because ordinary during its time still meant that it was good quality, and that's absolutely the case here. While Sony's Walkman line tends to get the most attention from retro tape collectors, there were plenty of competing models that were just as good, if not better. And that can also save a lot of money. The first SX20 I bought cost about $6 US from Yahoo Auctions Japan, and the second was a little under 12. Between shipping and the replacement belts, I would have spent maybe $30 or so total to get one of them restored. Considering how nice of a player I ended up with, that's a bargain any tape enthusiast would find hard to argue with. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp, and as always, thanks for watching.